Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends on the forum. I would like to welcome you to our August 2022 webinar. Uh, let me start by acknowledging Pa Adini Fuja, who has joined us. Welcome, sir. And our friends in the diaspora who are also here. I can see Dr. Ofowe, Dr. Joseph Anna. Welcome to our meeting. Uh, today gives me great pleasure to introduce a friend who has decided to step in a short notice to make a presentation to us, Dr. Ebolua Adejuigbe. If you recall, the presentation for this month was supposed to have been given by Dr. Hippolyte Amadi, but he called to say he wasn't available. And I quickly called on Ebola, and at such a short notice, she decided to take up the mantle. So Ebon, thank you very much. Uh, without wasting more time, I will hand over to the moderator for today, Dr. Yuriti Fajolu. Yuriti, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Ileto. And good afternoon once again to everyone who has joined us for this international webinar, because you must agree with me that it's international. Our speaker is, is national, but she's speaking to us from the abroad, if I can say that. And we have also colleagues like the Silito has said from the diaspora. So this afternoon, our topic for discussion is um, immediate kangaroo mother care. And like you all know, kangaroo mother care is nothing new to, well, I believe it's not, nothing new to most of us. And it's a form of providing thermal care for small and sick newborns. And it's actually, um, considered as a standard of care for these very small babies. In the past, people thought it was for countries who had low income and could not afford incubator care for these babies. However, over the years, it's been proven to be a standard of care and that is even better than incubator care. And I'm sure Professor Adeji will give us more information on kangaroo mother care, and especially immediate kangaroo mother care. Before we will do it for babies who are stable, but now we're talking of immediate kangaroo mother care. So not to waste our time, I'd like to once again introduce a speaker for this afternoon's um, seminar, Professor Ebonlu Adejuigwe. She's a professor of pediatrics and child health and a consultant pediatrician at the Obafemi Awolowo University and also the Obafemi Aulo University in Hospital Lilife. I'm sure she's going to tell you more about her university like she always does when she has to make a presentation. So Professor Adeju, we go over to you, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I feel honored to be in the midst of colleagues from Lagos State, the richest, most organized state. And I, I want to thank um, Dr. Leto for considering me for the presentation. I know it was a short notice, but I think it was worth it. It's to say worth it. And I pray that by the time I finish, it will be worth it because I think the information needs to go around. As I've been said, I'm a pediatrician from the Oba University, the first university in Nigeria. And I also work in the teaching hospital. And um, this is my beautiful university, the most beautiful university in West Africa. And, uh, and uh, the teaching hospital. I want to, sorry, to acknowledge the presence of uh, Pa Ajeni Fuja. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, sir, for still finding time to join academic program. And I want to thank the organizers that uh, they still, they, despite all the work we have to do in Lagos and the traffic, you still find time to do this every month. I think it's a body of emulation, and I congratulate you. And so I want to go into the topic uh, right away. We know that uh, globally, uh, newborn, uh, deaths, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a well known problem, it's a challenge. And uh, we know that uh, 20 million babies are born low birth weight. And of these 20 million, 95% of them are in low middle income countries, which are accounting for 70 to 80% of all neonatal deaths. 
And we also know that these low birth weight babies are prone to having growth retardation later in life and then developmental delays. And uh, it is also proven and well recorded that the global preterm rates are mainly in two countries, Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Though seven countries have been able to have theirs, the, the number of deaths, but uh, that has not happened in Nigeria. Instead, we are going higher. You can look at the trend in this uh, slide, the lower aspect, the left lower aspect. You can see the trend of unitary mortality. It's almost as if it's a flat line. In 1990, it was about 42, and presently it's about 38, 39 per 1,000 live births. So not much difference has occurred. Although we can see that the under five mortality has reduced. It, however, the under five mortality per se is not coming down because the natal mortality also participates in the uh, number of under five mortality. We know the common causes of uh, preterm uh, pre uh, deaths, mainly preterm delivery, 31% of them, and then infections and related causes, and then intrapartum related uh, complications, particularly bad asphyxia. So we, we know the reasons why they die. We know where they die, and yet they still die. And we know that 75% of newborn deaths can be prevented with high quality care. It does not have to be incubator care, but it is high quality care. Known things have been shown to, to be part of the reasons why you can reduce unitary mortality. Uh, historically, Dr. Niels Bergman, who was working in Zimbabwe then, you know, it had 10% survival of patients who were weighing between 1,200 grams and 1,500 grams. And then he introduced KMC into his ward. And when he did, he found out that 50% of the deaths was reduced, even with lower birth weights. Babies were weighing 1,000 grams. You know, some of them were surviving. And this was just introducing KMC. And what do I mean by kangaroo mother care or KMC? That's the kangaroo. The kangaroo is seen in Australia mainly, and we can see the patch where it keeps his, boy, his baby. And the, the main, the doctors Ray and Martinez in 1978, working in Colombia, actually introduced this, you know, because they had problems with incubators and the babies were dying. And so he introduced, and then over the years, many things have come in and modifications have also come in. The main components of kangaroo mother care is skin to skin contact between the mother and baby and newborn. It has to be skin to skin. So you can't use the carrier that normally that people use nowadays to put their babies on the chest. No, it has to be the mother's skin to the baby's skin. It has to be skin to skin. And then also frequent and exclusive or nearly exclusive breastfeeding. And then early discharge from the hospital. These are the main components of kangaroo mother care. And um, WHO has a recommendation even for the world, for the on the kangaroo mother care. And the recommendation says that in health facilities, routine care should include kangaroo mother care for babies who are less than 2,000 grams. They also recommended, they also put a caveat that it could give brief sessions of KMC can be given to babies who are recovering. They are not stable yet, but they are stable. So you can give them for one or two hours, then the mothers will put them back in the incubator or on the, on the resuscitator, then she come back again. However, when the babies are clinically stable, then they can continue continuous kangaroo mother care. And clin clinically stable, it's uh, well-defined uh, as to respiratory rate of the child, the child not needing respiratory support, the child not needing interven intra intravenous fluid, the child also, you know, just all the child is, is feeding and to grow before the child is discharged home. And currently, Nigerian guideline for kangaroo mother care has been launched in the year, I think, November 2021. And also the guidelines are in keeping with the WHO recommendation. However, there was a review, a concrete review in, the, uh, in 2016, which showed that 40% of neonatal deaths were reduced by kangaroo mother care. They found out that 65% reduction in sepsis occurred in people who had kangaroo mother care. 70% reduction in hypothermia, a 2% reduction in hypoglycemia, and 58% reduction in hospital readmission in infancy. They also found that there was exclusive 
breastfeeding, there was improvement at the age of one to two months, and then improvements in the anthropometric parameter of the baby. And with this, it, we thought kangaroo mother care was making a lot of sense and making waves, but only 40% of neonatal deaths were reduced. So we still need to work. How about the 60 percent that is left? You can see still the trend. This is a global trend that shows that we still have a high, it's more, it's more than one third of Nunita, of the under five mortality globally. So they still need to do something. Under five mortality, uh, Nunita mortality still needs to be reduced. The kangaroo mother care, remember WHO said it has to be when the babies are stable. That's when you start continuous kangaroo mother care. And so the study that was reviewed also showed that it was not started until the babies were, were stable. The earliest was at the age of three, three days. Somewhere at the age of 24 days. Being pediatricians, we all know how this low birth weight babies, particularly the very small ones, how long it takes them to stabilize. So, and we also know that majority of the neonatal deaths that occur, occur in the first one week of life, particularly in the first 24 hours. We have over 50% of neonatal deaths occurring during this period when they are not stable. And the KMC was for stable babies. So it says skin to skin stabilizes and prevents instability, you know. But these babies did not have KMC until they were stable. So that means they did not benefit from the effect. And so the, the basis for starting, for doing immediate kangaroo mother care. The first study, the studies that were shown, that were done, that were reviewed by Conkrain, the earliest was three days, or some 10 hours, but the, and the average about three days that kangaroo mother care was introduced. Babies were, many, over half were dead by then. And also, the guidelines was also in support of staying until the babies were stable. So somebody braved it in South Africa and in Vietnam, and they went ahead. They had very little babies, maybe like 40 babies, and they, they started immediate kangaroo mother care. And when they did this, they found that the babies you know, became stable earlier. And these are the papers where they were published, you know. They had they became stable earlier than those who were separated from their mothers. And so they decided, we decided to do this study on a larger scale. So it was a randomized control trial. It was a multi-country done in Africa and in Asia, Ghana, Malawi, Tanzania, and Nigeria, and then India. And the population of children to be studied were those who were we weighed between 1,000 grams to 1,799 grams. And they were in two arms. One arm was intervention arm that had immediate kangaroo introduced to them, kangaroo mother care, immediately close to delivery as much as possible. Whereas the control were put either in the incubator or in the resource and they were waited they were, until they were stable before they had kangaroo, uh, the continuous kangaroo mother care. And this is a team that did the work. So on the average, we had about 1,600 uh, patients in the intervention group and in the control group. And like I said earlier on, immediate kangaroo mother care was introduced to the intervention group as soon as possible after birth, whereas those who were in control group went through the normal routine, either they were rushed to the newborn ward by a nurse, put into the incubator or the resources chair until they were considered stable using the same criteria. And after that, we continued uh, continuous kangaroo mother care in what we call the MNIQ, mother and newborn intensive care unit. We are as the babies in the control arm were in the, uh, in the neonatal intensive care units. And after stabilization, everybody received the same treatment and they had continuous kangaroo mother care in the stable kangaroo ward. 
So this is just to show you pictures of Malawi. That's Malawi up there. And Malawi, you can see the mother, they have about, I think it's about 30 bedded uh, kangaroo mother care ward. And they just modified what they had there to do the to do the study. Ghana had, you can see the mother lying on the bed there. Okay, the mother and the baby. So it was the same word. They just partitioned it. So some part the mothers can stay. And this is the incubator where those in the control arm were staying. And this is Nigeria. We had this in, in, in our in our NICU. So these rooms were just converted to MNQs where the mothers. And you can see the big bed, the mothers can stay with their baby. Whereas in India, they had a total new world built for them, for mother, newborn intensive care units. Okay, and nurses were sent here to work in this mother, newborn intensive care unit. And so this is the bed. And I will just show you the, in each of the, uh, the facilities where this study took place. So you needed to have a warmer, you needed to have a monitor as well. We use the continuous pulse oximeters as a monitor there. Then you needed to have a CPAP. Each of the rooms had it. And then you also needed to have source of interventional fluid and also piped oxygen supply or oxygen from your CPAP. And then the bed had to be adjustable so that the mothers, you know, she can be comfortable. And usually there's, a, there's toilets and bedroom attached to where the mothers were kept. So the, our findings from the study, uh, we had about uh, 77,000 uh, mothers and 79,000 uh, infants screened. I know you, I, you understand that because of multiple births, that's why we had uh, more babies than mothers. And uh, we found that uh, 4,900 mothers and about 5,000 infants were eligible. And the reasons why they were not, some were not eligible were also, uh, is also stated there. And uh, they were randomized. And at the end of it, we had 1,470 mothers and 1,609 infants assigned to the immediate kangaroo mother care uh, group. We asked 1,700, 1,474 mothers and 1,602 mother and two infants were assigned to the conventional kangaroo mother care. It was a randomized control trial. These findings have been published in immediate kangaroo mother care and survival of infants with low birth weight in the New England Journal of Medicine in May 2021. And our findings show that uh, the median time to initiation at the different facilities for those who were in the uh, intervention group was one hour. It was shorter in my center, it was longer in some centers. And uh, we are asked for, for those who were in the control arm, it was after two days, which was just for the brief. Uh, sessions that's, as, as recommended by WHO, okay? And then we, we was also found out that um, it took about uh, uh, 17 hours for the for those uh, who were in uh, skin to skin, okay, to stabilize, okay? We realized it took about uh, 1.5 days for those who were in the control arms to become stable. And then, the duration of skin-to-skin -skin contact in kangaroo mother care ward was about 20 hours for both the control and the and those who were in the intervention hub. So we achieved our aim. They were well randomized and the study was well carried out. From the, uh, the objectives, one of them was to find out the mortality because we said we wanted to reduce neonatal deaths. And it was found that um, from enrollment to 28 days of, of age, with the number of deaths that we had in those who were in the intervention hour was 191, making 12%. Whereas we had 15.7% of those in the control group that died. And this was statistically significant. So there was 25% mortality reduction. And uh, in, in this, it is said that if we have to have the effect, you have to treat 27 low birth weight babies, you know, put them in kangaroo mother's position to be able to achieve, to, pre to prevent one death, which is better than even given vaccines. And most deaths were caused by sepsis or preterm pre uh, complications, which we already know, okay? And death from sepsis in the kangaroo mother care group 
was 4.4%, whereas it was 6.9% in those who were in the control. When we have subjected sepsis, that means no culture proven sepsis. About 27.8% of them occurred in control, whereas it was lower in those who were in the conventional, in the IKMC group. Hypothermia was also lower in those who were in the, in the IKMC group compared to the control. And so uh, for over 40 years, we didn't let mothers or uh, people come into the uh, NICU because of the fear that they would introduce infections. And indeed, to start this study, many people were actually very worried. They were thinking that if mothers have to come in and stay in the NICU, then the rate of infections will increase. But this has been shown that it's not so. Instead, kangaroo mother care started immediately after delivery, reduced the risk of sepsis. And the effect was not just in the in a particular group of baby, it was in all the groups, okay? It was in all the groups. Look at the, the, the birth weight of the babies. There, those less than, uh, from one to less than 1.2 kg, there was a reduction. Those who were 1.2 to 1.5 kg, there was also a reduction, you know? Though it was, it was higher in those who were 1.2 to 1.5 kg, and also those who were 1.5 to 1.8 kg, you know, the moderate um, uh, preterm babies, they still had a reduction in, in uh, mortality. Gestational age was also equally affected. All groups had decreased in, uh, in, the, in the mortality. It didn't matter whether you were very low birth weight or, or not. Even the type of delivery, it was also so. Those who had single thing uh, uh, or twins or even SGA, there was reduction in mortality in good groups, in all the groups. So why, why are we, what is the rationale for having immediate kangaroo mother care? How do we get in, what does it do? This is a, a, a Tama images uh, from, that I got from somebody. He got it from Professor Peter Hartman, but I got it from Niels Bagma, okay? So this is uh, a non-lactating breast on the left. And you can see the red area. This, if you see, this is the gauge here to show you the different um, temperatures. You can see that the red part, that is uh, 28, 38, this is 24 when it's yellow, 30 when it's green or so, okay? So they had the temperature, they had the, 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 the red the area that to show that there's heat, okay? So this is a non-lactating breast. And you can see compared to a lactating breast, you can see that there's a lot of heat in the, you know, in the lactating breast. You can see the lots, lots and lots of heat of hair. Of hair. And so what's the relevance of this? Okay, so for babies that are kept in the chest, they get a lot of warmth from the chest of their mother. Okay, and it's been shown that relative risk of neonatal death, according to the temperature of the patients, okay, that if you are, if, if the temperature is less than 35 degrees Celsius, they have about 10 to 20 times higher risk chance of dying. And even the very narrow temperature of 36 to 36.4, it doubles the risk of death. And we all know that, yes, incubators can take care of this if it occurs, but sometimes it does occur before incubator can prevent it. And uh, so the, the risk, the, the transfer of heat from the mother, okay, is one of the reasons why the babies survive. And it's been shown to be as effective as incubator care for rewarming and for preventing hypothermia in preterm low birth weight babies. And also sepsis, the death from sepsis, we said 4.4, it was lower in those who had IKMC compared to those who had, uh, those who were in the, in the incubators. So the, this is a newborn baby and everything looks good, okay? In fact, the resuscitia shows that the temperature there is 37.9. And yet, if you use uh, a camera to determine the distribution or, you know, of the temperature, you can see that this is, the lower, this is the lower part of the babies. This is the leg. There's peripheral vessel constriction. This child has just been born. You can see a lot of heat here, but look at the lower part, 32.1 degree. And you will not notice this because you think the baby is doing fine. And the same thing happened. Look at the arms, 34.2. Because of peripheral vessel constriction, you know, like a bad effect. Even the air, there's dampness of the air also actively cooling the head. 
So the, the cascade of dysregulation occur when there's hypothermia into bradycardia, hypoglycemia, hypo, hypoxia, and of course, it will increase mortality. So originally from the KMC studies, the babies who were, who were unstable were excluded and they were the ones that had a higher mortality, okay? So it's found that okay, if you introduce something that will keep them, like skin to skin stabilizes and prevents instability, even at this time. Whereas the best that incubator can do is to treat instability. So the about 400,000 deaths can be prevented if KMC started at birth. That was the conclusion. Okay, these are just thermal images. And this can show that the baby can also be protected. Okay, by putting the child on the mother's chest, the baby can be protected. Because we know that um, the microbiome in the mother's body, some of them, you know, the antibodies have been produced and they are secreted in the colostrum and in the breast milk for the baby. So the baby gets the antibodies, you know, to the, uh, to the organisms that are around the mother. And this enhances survival and prevents infection. The other thing is also that if you put the baby on the mother's chest, they tend to lactate much faster than, than, many of their, than mothers who don't have their babies with them. And it's been said that if you start expression or you put the baby to the breast in the first hour, of life, that the production of milk by six weeks will be 130% greater. So there's a need to put the babies to breast on time. And the skin to skin position is the best way to encourage the mother to put the baby to breast. Even if the baby is not suckling, the expression of breast milk, which we tend to do, you know, seems to, to be the stimulus and it helps the mothers to produce more milk. If you start expression after one hour, you have lost that, that magic. And the, the volume of fluid of, of breast milk that you get at six weeks will be less, 130% less than you'll have gotten if you had said that expression at that first hour of, of the of delivery. So suckling also helped this. And these are the things that breast milk, uh, that uh, skin to skin, kangaroo mother care encourages. There's also what we call the toxic stress. Strong and prolonged activation of the body's stress management system in the absence of the buffering protection of an adult support can lead to what they call toxic stress. So when a baby is separated from the mother, studies have shown, there are, there are references to this, that a baby that's separated from the mother has, is, is anxious, you know, and is not able to, to, to keep himself well. The adult support that will have been there, you know, when the baby moves, is no longer is not there, and this can cause disruption of the brain architecture, even to the mismanagement of stress, even later in life. And it's associated with cellular physical and mental disorders later in life. So, given putting the baby and the mother together, what they call zero separation. We remove this absence and we reduce the secretion of cortisol, which is the hormone responsible for the stress, the toxic stress, and cause dysregulation. So the attention should actually be focused to, to the time the baby is born, because uh, what happens in the uh, 1,000 days after birth is influenced by what happens at the 1,000 seconds after birth. So this, the sense of smell, the sense of touch has been cho shown to increase secretion of breast milk, to increase protection, to also increase, the, reduce the stress level of the baby. The cardiorespiratory regulation is also been said to be increased in babies who are supported by their mothers in the KMC position, in skin to skin position. And these studies have been done to show that there's cardiac increased cerebral blood flow and better adaptation when mothers have their babies on their chest. So uh, this has uh, policy implications because uh, for before, before now, 
particularly in government hospitals, we tend to separate mothers. We insist on separating mothers from their babies. But I think that in private parties, this is even easier for you because it's, it's, uh, it, uh, I know many people do rooming in, but what we are asking now is for zero separation, the baby on the mother's chest, as much as possible, as long as possible. And I can say to you that even in this study that we did, uh, sudden infant death was much lower in babies who were on in kangaroo mother care position. And you know, we don't even know the reason why the baby will have seed, but it was the incidence was lower in those who were in the, on the mother's chest. And we can understand why, because the mother is there 24 seven, the baby is on her chest. And the, the mothers actually said, when the, 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 like the baby is in their womb, so every movement of the baby, they feel it and they know it. And they get to know the baby's cues. He wants, you know, the baby needs food. The baby wants to sleep. You know, the baby is uncomfortable because the baby is right on their chest. And so the babies are in your wards. You can, the babies can be put on their mother's chest. However, we need to do, of course, we need to monitor and do many other things, which I'll mention here, okay? So to keep the mother and the baby together, is the right thing to do. It's what God had ordained from the beginning. The mother is the best carer for the baby. And this is believed to revolutionize uh, neonatal care. In this case, the health care providers will also need to learn how to initiate IKMC in the delivery room, you know, how to help the mothers. You can see a picture there. That's somebody with the baby is being put there. You know, this is the, the softer inner part, a binder that helps to hold the baby in place, okay? And then this one is the one that covers the mother so that the mother oh, right. doesn't feel it. And uh, this, uh, is, uh, this is the transportation, okay, to the, to the queue, to the mother newborn care uh, units. So this is the, you have to put the mother on the, or uh, if the place is far from your wards or from a labor ward or a labor or theater, the mother, the, the surrogate or the mother puts, puts the baby on her chest and then the, she's wheeled to the, to the mother newborn care units. And also you have to teach, you know, how to continue to monitor the babies. Because even in this position, the babies are being monitored and they have to be around, okay? Which I think in the private hospital is easier. Uh, the doctor who is taking care of the mother, maybe they want to take care of the baby or even they are different, but they can see the mothers the same place and see the baby at the same time, which is easier for the mother and everybody. So the... It's been found that, in, like I've just said now, immediate kangaroo mother care reduces neonatal death by 25%, and that it will increase the number of babies that will live globally, about 150,000 lives will be saved every year if we do this. It's a paradigm shift, and it is necessary. And this is just a diagram of the floor that uh, Professor uh, Westro actually drew to just, in the, to just show you how this can be done. Okay, you can have Nikki with four beds, family room and family room and then okay and so everybody you can have beds there and the baby is on the mother's chest and the family can come in the father can come in they can also stay in developed country which is also being done it's been done in uh sweden and in norway as well okay and they have this they have private rooms they have mothers and uh, their husbands staying there and when you have multiple sometimes the fathers assist and sometimes the mother can put the two of them on her chest at the same time and so this then is Bergman with his grandchild. Uh, this Bergman now lives in Sweden. He's moved from Zimbabwe. So I think I, I would like to say thank you for the audience. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Epuadejuigbe. I must confess I've listened to this presentation. I think it's my third time or fourth time of listening to it. And every time I listen to it, I just say, wow, KMC is just the way to go. So um, before we go on to questions, I'll quickly like to acknowledge the presence of some of our elders and teachers on this call. Um, Professor, I mean, Baba Jenny Fuja has been on. He joined before almost every other person came in. We are welcome, sir. He's always found time to join us on these academic um, activities. And um, we are highly appreciated, sir. Also, Professor Nikkei Green is also on all the way from America. I can see Dr. Agbato, Dr. Nifade, 
Professor Kuleolo, who is also on the call, Professor Iziaka, Professor Iridi. We are all here and a lot, of, a lot more others are on the call. So see that this is something that we've kept and uh, thanks to Dr. Mubola Jilawa, who is unavoidably absent, who is the brain behind these um, sessions. We really appreciate him. So before I talk too much, <laughs> I want to leave the floor open for comments, questions on the presentation. So if you have a comment or a question, please can you signify by raising your hand so that you'll be called. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Just to add that uh, Dr. Bubalaji Lawal is online now and oh, has joined okay. the session. So at some point he would uh, make his comments. But there are some questions already in the chat box. Maybe you need to look at that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm looking at the chat box now and um, I see a question from, or is it a comment from Dr. Nifade? Lovely presentation. Thank you ever so much. The emphasis on skin to skin makes me wonder how the mother's modesty was protected. Do you have pictures of how the babies were placed? Were placed? Then I got the impression, but may be wrong, but did you at some point suggest that if mom is not available, a surrogate can be used? Um, let me look, um, Professor Adejube, please let me just look at the chat if there are more questions. I think that's the only question on the chat for now. So please, you can go ahead to answer. Okay, then. thank you very much. Thank you for the suggestion. Actually, I had some pictures, I thought, it was too long, so I cut my presentations for the time. So the, yes, uh, the mother's privacy were protected. Once you put the baby on the right on the chest, I showed a, a binder earlier on, and uh, you use the binder to, to put the baby in the position. Then you also then give the mother something like a shirt that she can wear. And that's, uh, she can use that to move around the wards. And uh, so their privacy were protected. And uh, okay, like, okay, this is a mother. I don't know whether you can see. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is a mother with a baby on her chest. And that's how most of them were. You know, they have this, this shirt like covered. The, the baby is inside. Okay. And secondly, a surrogate is one of the things that has to make this thing go on because the mother cannot be there 24 seven. Sometimes she wants to go to the restroom. You don't want the baby to go with her to the restroom so that do, she doesn't fall off and something goes wrong. She wants to, and then she has to go in areas where they are allowed to move out of the world. In my hospital, they were not allowed to move out of the world because you know, they have to pay and the rest, you don't want anybody escaping. But in areas where it is free care, they are allowed to move out and they can roam around the world if the babies are not you know, on, um, on IV fluids or respiratory supports. Okay, so uh, the surrogates can help the mothers. The mothers want to go and do anything and take the baby. And that is one of the reasons why we're able to achieve 20 hours, a continuous 20 hours. So that whenever the mother leaves, the baby has the, uh, the, the, the surrogate takes over the, the care of the baby. And in some centers, even the fathers could do it. If they don't have a mother or your auntie or somebody to do. But as long as the mother is going to be the surrogate, the surrogates can do it. Thank you. Another question says, um, um, this is from Joseph Anna. Great, great that you showed that mothers will be in the NICU with their babies. How did you overcome the resistance to change to introduce the MNICU? Okay. So thank you very much. That was um, a big one for, for us. I said in India, they built a whole new world that is called MNQ. And because I think it's 11 bedded. And so they transferred nurses there to go and work there, knowing that they're going to be taking care of the mother and the baby. Whereas in our hospital, we had to uh, uh, convert some parts, okay, that were for to the to MNQ. And what we did was just to have discussions with our nurses, continuous discussion to make them see what we are saying, because Many people will feel that, okay, it's extra work for them. 
they don't have, there's no additional hands, but we had additional hands in terms of the research. You know, so we employed some nurses, qualified nurses who were also there. Okay, but we wanted the nurses on the ward to also be part of it so that they can also be taking care of the mothers and get used to doing it. Initially, there was a lot of resistance. There's some even felt that it's going to cause that some babies will fall off the mother's care, the mothers will sleep on the baby, but that never happened. I think it's just a, a maternal instinct. You never sleep on your baby. You just, you just accept. And mothers who are severely depressed or who had other problems were not even allowed to do that. They were one of the exclusion criteria. So we didn't have anything. So it was initially, of course, for even for us, we did the study. Initially, we were a little bit worried too, that we, particularly the one KGB, we were very small, very sure how they would do, but we didn't have any, no incident whatsoever. The mothers got used to it and everybody got used to it in the world. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Adejibi. Another question from Michael Agu says, when do you suggest education of the mothers should start? I suspect yeah, yeah. right from ANC visits and that, and what are the important things we must educate the mothers on to make KMC most effective? Yeah, thank you very much. So you said the answer already. I actually feel that we can start before the ANC by making people aware of it, you know, like having diagrams, you know, pictures of mothers who have babies in their chest on the, in the facilities. You know, so that even when they are not pregnant, they come to the hospital for any other thing to visit a friend or so, they can see pictures and they say asking questions. What does this mean? What is you know? And then so in ANC particularly, then you go ahead and tell them. You don't pray that they have preterm beliefs, but it does occur. And if it occurs, this is what is happening. And what we were doing was also to take mothers from our own world, you know, those who are ambulatory, to take them to the ANC to go and show the mothers there, so that they can see these women in it and they can also prepare their mind. And then we also tell them that if you are coming to the hospital, if you know for you have any problem before you are even you are, your date is due, please bring somebody along that you can trust to take the baby for you. So that's a solo gate, you know, preparing them. Because some mother, particularly after students, they cannot come to our ward yet. Okay. So the first few hours, they may need a solo gate to do it for them. So you, you tend to tell them uh, how to prepare and tell them that all they just need to do is to eat well, nothing to worry about, you know. And they will see other mothers doing it. Preparation in ANC is very, it's very crucial. By the time they see this, they are used to it and they just come in and they just flow with the other mothers. Thank you. I'll take the next three or four questions together so that you can answer them together. So um, Dr. Chukune says, thanks for the presentation. Since mothers are now in the NICU, any cost implications, especially in private settings, then would, um, Somebody is asking if they're allowed to answer, ask questions. Yes, we'll still allow you to ask questions, but if you can type in the chat box, it's fine. Um, Dr. Doherty, or De Doherty says, um, we need to educate mothers on many things right from me and see. I think she's just answering the last question. Our social pediatrics curriculum will reflect this. Then, um, Somebody also said something about the fathers. I'm looking for, since fathers are not lactating, so how do you, how does that um, come, become effective? I'm looking for that question. I saw it just a few minutes ago. But maybe you can answer this okay. too while I look for the others. Okay, so for the public sector, for the uh, cost implication is that accurate for the mothers is much lower because the mother and the baby are occupying one bed. The, the baby is on the mother's chest. You don't, you don't build her for her chest. You know, it's, a, it's the baby's right. The baby just have that, okay? But I think for private parties, I believe that once mother see this, they, 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 because even the mothers who were not in the intervention group, whose babies were bigger than our study population, they wanted to be part of the study because they, they, they liked the father, the baby and the mother were together and that the mother knew what was happening to the baby and she was involved. So I believe that in private sector, it's gonna, of course, the conclusion will be that the mother, the, the, this is a room for you and everything is there like you normally do because your baby is in, on your chest. I mean, the care will be, you just cost the care according to this because all, everybody, the only difference is that you are having the care at a different position. Everything else you do for the baby who is in the incubator, you do it for this baby. If they need therapy, you give them therapy there. You can do intermittent, you can use 
a billy a billy blanket you know to wrap around the baby i saw that being used in colombia you can use it for the baby you know while the baby is on the mother's chest so i believe that even for the private practice is a thing that most mothers will love and the fact that they are they are together with their mother there'll be there'll be you'll also be monitoring so they'll pay for all that they'll pay for the for the continuous monitoring you are doing they'll pay for the support you are also given so i'm not sure that it will make um, it will reduce your revenue in the private sector mm. but the, in, in the in the federal definitely uh it it, it, it reduces the cost to the mothers because now they come they come to the uh the kangaroo mother care uh, ward and they are they have their own bed they have their baby with them so they don't have to pay for incubator care like we were billing before the other question is about the father father as surrogates yes it can be used yes they're not lactating but we know that it's not just uh, lactation that uh, KMC is for. There's also, it bonds the brother and the, the family and the baby together. And uh, it also, there's still, of course, there's still some heat. Even in the chest I showed you, there was no lactating. Okay, so there's a difference. And remember that these babies, because they are very low battery, they can easily have apneic attacks. The father's heart is also beating. One of the things that make babies to remember to breathe is that continuous reading that comes from the heart. So it's still very useful for both baby and for the family, even if the father that is doing the KMC. I hope you haven't lost uh, Dr. Fajul. So I Hello. think I, I can, yes, because I'm here. Okay. Of, uh, the moderator, I think we've lost her. Yes, I think there's another question okay. there. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm, is that, actually, is okay, Dr. Back. Okay. Let's, please, can you help me? Because I think I will have lost the chats. I was oh, going yeah. out momentarily, so I don't okay, know. Okay, there's a question. Say when I say that, was there any medical implication on the mothers whilst you did the zero separation? Medical implications. I don't know. I yeah, don't understand yeah. what. For instance, means. were they less ambulance? And if they were less ambulance, did that have any effect on them medically? That's okay. the mothers now or the surrogates. Yeah. Okay. Then. Okay. The, the mothers we are they were allowed to move around. They could uh, they, because when they are when the babies are on respiratory support. The, the, rest, the CPAP has, can be moved to a radiance. They can move around their rooms. They are allowed to move around. They are allowed, they are, the mothers were allowed to move around, to move around at least for some time. So that, and then the ONG were also uh, checking them, making sure that they don't have any DVT or anything. They, are, they were allowed to move around. Once they, you move all the respiratory support, that's when they can then uh, move freely anywhere within the world. They went anywhere, you know. And I said in other hospitals, they were allowed to even move out of their wards. Okay, but because they had to pay in my hospital, they were not allowed to move out of the walls. You know, uh, the nurses wanted to be sure that they don't disappear, you know, but nobody even attempted to do that. But they were allowed to move around. They can stand up, they can move to the, for instance, leave the bed, come out to the opening. Uh, usually it's just for two days, two to three days. The babies are stable and you move the baby from the respiratory support and then they can also go on, go ahead, you know, to, to the stable KMC ward. So they are allowed to move around. Thank you. There are two other questions. Then after this, I'll ask if there's there are people who want to ask questions by raising up their hands. So Dr. Um, Shotiman is asking that the mortality in the intervention group was 12%, while that in the control group was 15, making a total of total mortality of 27%. Was this value of 27 significantly less? Than the preterm mortality rate in these facilities prior to the initiation of it. And um, Dr. Ochisko says that following the publication of the WHO led study, as the KMC guidelines been updated to include immediate KMC, and does the doctor stay? The doctor stay released guidelines in Nigeria. I'm not sure also include 
recommendation for I'm not sure I really understand that last part of it. Please, can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I verbalize my question? I was saying, okay, Dr. Please. Ibe, sorry, it's Dr. Ochi Ibe. And uh, my question is, okay. after the study that has been published, has the WHO guidelines been released, um, updated? And if, if the recently released guidelines in Nigeria also has recommendations for immediate KMC? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ibe. Thank you. So I, the, the guideline has been updated. I, I, I should be released, it was supposed to be released last month. I don't know what delayed it, it should be released by now. But the national guideline was, um, was actually published before the WHO guideline was, yeah, we were in the process of adapting and everything, you know, before. So it, it will also be updated to include the IKMC. But the IKMC is now in the WHO guideline and that should be released anytime from now because it was supposed to be released last month. I don't know what caused the delay, but I guess that it should be before the end of the year. We should have it out. And they are, yeah, I don't want to say more than that. So it is, it is released already. And uh, the, I can't remember the other question, but- uh, About the mortality. Which I said okay, yeah, the mortality. mortality. What was it in the- Yeah. Of the study. The mortality the was quite high before the, some, some places was 40%. In some places it was, um, it was 50%, 50, 50, like they had even in Zimbabwe. It, the, like I said earlier on, the difference was just the place of care. For, to, do this, to do this study, uh, every, all the facilities had WHO minimal care package implemented. That means that we had respiratory supports, which we didn't have before, like CPAP, like pause oximeter to monitor. We don't have to touch the pain. You can see it you know, from afar. The beeps when there's a problem, you know. And then we had IV fluid was there before. We just continued, you know. And uh, so every facility that took part had the WHO minimal care package implemented. So, of course, that would have reduced some mortality. But at least even though the, the, the care was the same for the two groups, you can still see the difference in the mortality among those who were on I, immediate IKMC compared to those who had greater care. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I see Professor Grange has her hand raised up. Prof. Ma, you have the floor. Thank you. Good, Good morning, afternoon, I'm here. Okay, good morning. Today, it's nice good morning, to talk to you once more. Hey, boom. Ah, well thank done. you, ma'am. Thank well, you, ma'am. One, one of our very dynamic pediatricians. Thank and I'm you, I'm so happy that um, the torch was passed over to, to you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, yeah. um, you see, as I listen to all these brilliant uh, presentations, and also the fact that a lot of hard work has been going into improving the lives of babies, improving even the lives of mothers. And we carry this from the hospital to the community. But it's been very difficult for us to carry it to the policy makers. This is our problem. You see, you, you have this big divide between what is happening at the hospital level and, uh, and the, uh, what is happening at the ministerial level. Nobody seems to be able to uh, recognize the fact that you cannot get to ministerial level without all the work that is being done at the policy level. So my suggestion is this, that apart from using all your experience to train uh, those who are coming behind in the clinical aspects of this and saving lives, very important, you should also look at what are the areas where you can um, continue to build upon in terms of getting data to support the fact that you are saving lives and 
brains. Not life, not only lives, but brains as well. And that's what you have shown us today, that by, you know, giving this kangaroo care, even the brains of the babies are being saved. So, what do we do? We have to look at uh, doing studies, follow-up studies, long-term studies. And if they ourselves cannot do it, we must look for references. We must find out how to use the results of their studies to bring this our argument into the policy arena. It is only by saying that, look, you guys in the ministry, you are making all these policies and all that, but you are not investing into what we are doing to help you make your policies. Um, I, you know, when I was in the ministry, we tried to do this. We, I would try to bring pediatricians into it and all that. But the, the culture did not permit it. So we still have to try to build it gradually. And we can only build it gradually by um, bringing into our own level of consciousness the need to do this. Uh, so what can you do today for us? Try and give us maybe a couple of references that show that kangaroo baby mother care will prevent um, things like ADHD, like, you know, uh, um, mental health problems in children, um, educational disadvantages, etc. They are there. And I just want you to, you to know that it is equally important for you to bring this up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma. Nice to see you again, Ma. Hey, long way. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much. So, Ma, like, uh, like I want to say that uh, following this study, we are actually done a follow-up study on you know, development of the babies who were in this study. And uh, that will be published soon. But I think that the, the findings are quite interesting. And that's, and that's just for two years after the study. As we have suggested, Ma, I think there's need for a long term, a long term follow up to do this as well. The other aspect is also that we, supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics, we have had a town hall meeting on the, the IKMC findings in Nigeria. Uh, we are, we try to bring in the policy makers and the other stakeholders, including the chief medical directors of different hospitals, so that they can go back and at least uh, make the atmosphere conducive for our colleagues to implement this. And lastly, WHO itself is sponsoring the implementation research on IKMC. And uh, we hope that uh, with the funds they are releasing, we should be able to scale up a little bit, at least so, uh, some parts of Nigeria. And uh, hoping the ministry is also involved in this. They are also part of the development of the protocols that will be used and in choosing of sites. So we believe that this will also uh, assist the policymakers to see the need to bring this in, into their uh, programs. Thank you very much, Ma. And as for the references, Ma, I will keep looking for, out for them. Thank you very much, Ma. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Professor Adejibi. Um, I can't see any other hand up, and our time is fast spent. We've had a good time this afternoon listening to Professor Adejibi on IKMC. I know a lot of questions will still be in, on the minds of people in terms of the cost implication. At the start of COP. Wow. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Elisu, Dr. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ebu. And doc, thank you very much, Iriti. I would like Dr. Mobolaji Lawa to say a few words before we round up. Dr. Mobolaji Lawa, sir. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Sainde. I had hoped to just uh, appear incognito. I wasn't sure I'll be able to join at the beginning, so I sent an apology. But I really did not 
want to miss this presentation by Professor Adeju again. I had missed it once. So I had to summon effort to attend. And I'm so happy that I did, even though I was a bit late. So I congratulate Professor Adeju Ibe for this presentation. Uh, very, very um, interesting. And the need to link uh, the experience, the practice experience to policy uh, has been aptly emphasized by Professor Grange and uh, Professor Anna in the, and the um, lecturer herself. And I think this is where the challenge is. Uh, in particular, uh, private sector is, a, is difficult to penetrate uh, because this kind of innovations have significant uh, impact on the, how you rearrange the services and so on. So in the private sector in particular will need special orientation and special training and you know um, for the for everyone to accept it both the, both the clients and the and the and the staff um, and I believe this group can do something about that by you know arranging uh, in, in collaboration of course uh, with the necessary agencies to have uh, um, training and orientation um, so that's just the little comment I have. I'm pleased to be here. I'm also very pleased to see Professor Anna, my old friend, Joanna. You are welcome, Joe. Um, he's, an, uh, he's, go he's going to be our next uh, lecturer Thank you very on, uh, clini on clinical governance. And we'll, I look forward to hearing that next month. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Sandy, for holding the fort and everyone for attending. Once again, I congratulate uh, Ebon for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very so, much, sir. So, so in rounding up, Dr. Uh, Elet, also, over to you. Thank you, Yuriti. In rounding up, I would like to especially thank uh, Ebon again, uh, even though the notice was short and uh, I kept calling her. And like Yuriti uh, said, she's in the abroad, as we say. Despite the time zone difference, she decided that she'll be up early to make this presentation. So I thank you very much, Evo. Thank and, you. Uh, in our usual manner, we will knock on your door again at some point. Please accept us as we are and uh, help us out. Iriti, thank you very much. I uh, couldn't have asked for any other person to moderate since you are a neonatologist like Evo. So, and you know yourself, so it was easy to for both of you to coordinate <laughs> this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you to Pajini Fuja, Professor Grange, yes. for usually and always being around to support us. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Pa. For, for, for the others who, who joined you from abroad, Ochi Ibe, I will knock on your door as well very soon, so don't worry. Now that I know you are, you've joined our group, <laughs> Professor Ofoe, from, say, all the way from Sierra Leone. I'm aware you were supposed to be at a meeting, but you decided to dodge that meeting to attend this one. Thank you. And to everybody who has joined, a big thank you. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, Dr. Mubalajila has already told us who our next presenter will be. And we look forward to a wonderful presentation next week, next month. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Thank, bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 B